this week we're going to be talking about roses, uh, rose care. And um, Donna Pemberton is with us tonight. And Donna Pemberton is a program associate here with us in Middlesex County. And she's been with the Master Gardener program for over 30 years. She was once actually the Master Gardener coordinator before I was here. And so she's a wealth of, of knowledge, um, and especially when it comes to herbs and rose gardening. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Donna. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about roses. Now, roses have often been called the queen of flowers. And I'm sure many of you have a love of roses, or at least an interest in them. But I bet some of you are thinking, you're just going to be too hard to grow, or I'm going to have to give up so much of my free time to grow them. It doesn't have to be that way. I'm going to briefly go through a number of conditions that the roses really need or like to grow to be healthy, and then we're going to go through a series of roses that have stood the test of time. They're hardy, durable and very disease resistant. In fact, many of these roses I have had growing in my garden for over 20 years. So we can begin. This first picture you see is a beautiful rose garden. Uh, it doesn't happen to be mine though, but I wish it was. Well, the rose garden that you're looking at on this one picture probably is the end of May, early June, since that's when rose gardens are at their most magnificent. What do we need? Uh, to grow some healthy roses. Well, one of the first things that roses need, need, good sunlight, full sunlight, in fact, at least six hours. If you can give them more, that's better. You can give them a little less, but they may not produce as many flowers for you, and the foliage may not be as healthy. So about six hours minimum of direct sunlight is really good for your roses. They also need good drainage. Roses do not like to have their roots in water. In fact, most plants don't. So if your soil may be very wet, what can you do? Well, you can do container gardening with roses, or you can, in fact, ra make raised beds. My husband, which I like to say promised me a rose garden, and he did deliver, uh, created a rose garden for me, raised it up 15 inches. Good air circulation is good. Why? because it will help the foliage of your rose bushes to um, be very healthy and lush. Now, I recommend that you get a soil test uh, on your property if you have never had one or if it's been a long time since you've had one. You can call your local Rutgers Cooperative Extension Office, and they, for a fee, they will send you a soil test kit. Follow the directions carefully. Mention that you hope to grow roses and do the test properly. Send it in. In a few weeks' time, you will get, um, you will get a result from them, a report, which will be very detailed. What will they tell you? Well, they're going to tell you what type of soil you have. Is it sandy? Is it silt-like? Is it clay? An important point, too, is they'll tell you the pH. What is pH? It will tell you how acid your soil is or how non-acid or alkaline. Roses prefer a pH of 6.5. Now, you can go up to 7, which is neutral, and you can go down to about 6, which is even a bit more acidic. That's okay. You just don't want to go to extremes. The soil test report will also tell you about various nutrients in your soil. It will make recommendations to you on what to add to your soil to grow healthy roses, and maybe what not to add. Now, uh, one of the things you have to consider with roses, unfortunately, is disease. The biggest disease problem you may face is black spot. You can see in the lower uh, portion of the picture what black spot looks like. Guess what? It happens to look like black spots with a fringe around the edge, and it turns the leaf yellow. Eventually, will make the leaves fall off. Well, I've seen recommendations that you should pick up all the leaves. Well, if you can do that, good luck. I've never had success with that. I will pick up as many as I can. Now, disease doesn't come every year. Black spot may be bad in some years, not so bad in others. Certain bushes may get it worse than other years. Certain bushes get it worse than other plants. I tried to plant disease-resistant roses, and later I'm going to show you some of those roses. 
If your roses get it, hopefully it can withstand it. Mine have for over 15 years, and I rarely spray. But if you happen to have a tender rose bush you love, and you find that the black spot is just overwhelming it, you will need to use an appropriate fungicide. It should be labeled for roses or ornamental plants, and it should list black spot control. Follow the recommendations on the packet. Don't add more and don't add less. For insects, you can see up, up in the right-hand corner those big uh, coppery beetles. Well, they may look pretty, but they're not so pretty on your roses. They love roses. They're Japanese beetles. I haven't seen too many. In fact, I haven't seen any for a few years now. But if it's a bad year, well, there's a few things you could do. If you're brave enough, take a bucket of soapy water and go out and pick them and drown them. If you don't want to do that, you need to purchase an insecticide, again, that is labeled for Japanese beetles but lists uh, roses or ornamental plants. Again, follow the recommendations carefully not to add more and not to add less. These are probably the two biggest problems that you may face with your roses. Well, if you give some of those conditions to your roses, what do you need next? Uh, a rose bush. I recommend a quality rose bush, a number one grade rose bush. Where could you get them? Well, you can go to your local nursery, box store, or you can go online to companies that specialize in selling plants. They may include roses, right? Or those companies that just sell rose bushes, and they will sell you hopefully quality rose plants. Now, you need to know what class of roses you're interested in. And when we go through the pictures, you will see the differences in them. There's hybrid teas. They produce these beautiful oval urn-shaped buds on long stems. You know, the roses you get in bouquets. Floribundas, they tend to be very bushy. The flowers usually come in clusters. Then you have climbers. Well, they produce canes that could be 10, 15, 20 feet long. You need to have some structure that you could adhere them to so that they, because they need support. Then there are shrub roses. What does, what does that mean? Well, they're, they're very shrubby. They mostly produce their flowers in clusters or they're single and they tend to be smaller. Maybe not so great for a cut flower, but pretty tough and durable. You have the English shrub roses. Mr. David Austin from England took old world roses and bred them with modern roses, and he gave us these spectacular roses called the English roses. They look like old-fashioned roses. They have wonderful scent, but they're very bushy, and the nice thing is they repeat in their bloom all through the summer, where many of the old-time roses, or ancient roses they call them, only bloom once. Then you also have miniatures. These are sweet little darlings that may grow up to about two feet tall. They're great for lining a bed with roses or growing in containers. Now, when you purchase a rose plant, a rose bush, it's going to come in two forms. It's going to be either grafted or grown on its own root. You look at the picture on the right, that's a grafted rose. What does that mean? You see there's a nubby growth, and the canes radiate out from that nubby growth. Underneath is the shank of the rose plant and then the roots. When you plant a grafted rose, I like to dig the hole about 12 inches deep and 18 inches wide. You may see some, uh, you know, books that mention 24 inches deep. Uh, good luck. I've never been able to dig a hole that deep, but if you can, that's fine. You're going to build a mound at the bottom of the hole, and you're going to put that grafted rose on top, spread the roots out. Here's something very important. You see that grafted area, that budded area? That should be one to one and a half inches below the soil in our area. Why? You want to protect that grafted union from bitter cold winds, bitter cold temperatures, and any damage that may happen if you're pruning or doing some weed whacking around the rose bush. What happens if that grafted union is killed? 
you lose the top rose, which is the rose you really want in your garden, and the bottom rose, which it's grafted to, is usually a wild rose. So you kind of get two roses for one, but you don't want the bottom rose growing in your garden. The rose bush on the left is an own root rose bush. What does that mean? It was grown on its own roots. Uh, they are a little easier to plant, but again, I would dig a hole about 12 inches deep, you know, 18 inches wide to loosen the soil. But when you plant an own root rose, depending on the size, you're going to lightly cover the roots with the soil. These roses, the nice thing is if something was to happen to the top part of the rose, as so long as the roots survive, it'll grow back. So the own root roses may come smaller in size at first, and some of them take two to three growing seasons uh, to get established in your garden. Now, with your roses, you're going to have to do some maintenance. Okay, what do you need? Watering. How much water should you give your roses, particularly during the summer? A little guy that I use and I go by is I give each rose bush two to three gallons of water per week during a dry spell. If you have sandy soil, you probably will have to add a little more. If you can, it's best to water in the morning. Why? The roses need the water to get through the hottest part of the day. And they often say keep as much moisture off the leaves as possible. If you water in the morning, that's not going to be a problem. But of course, if it rains at night, what could you do? Fertilizing. Well, there's many types of fertilizers. There's liquid and there's granular. I personally use granular. Nothing wrong with liquid fertilizer. There are rose fertilizers specific for rose bushes. I think it makes it a little easier on how much and what kind of nutrients you're going to be providing. But whatever material you use, whatever rose food, granular, liquid, again, follow the directions on the bag or on the bottle. Now, when do you fertilize? First fertilizer is at bud break. That's when the leaves are coming out. That's the first fertilizing. Then your plants are going to be blooming. They're going to look lovely. It's going to be about, oh, four or five weeks later that you're going to do a second fertilization after the first big flush of blooms is over. So that'll take you to about the end of June. You can do another fertilizing in July, again, depending on the material you're using. And the last fertilization is done mid-August, nothing after that. You want your roses to toughen up and begin to wind down to prepare themselves to go into more or less dormancy for the winter time. If you keep fertilizing your roses, you're going to encourage them to put out a lot of green lush growth. And that first frost is going to zap them. Monitoring. Well, you need to keep monitoring your roses um, for insect problems, disease problems, or anything else you notice so that you can take care of the problem when it's a smaller problem to determine disease, insect problem, and handle it. Now, pruning, I'm just going to mention a few things about pruning. When should you be pruning? Well, again, at bud break, when the leaves start coming out, you could see the form of your rose bush better. They might say, what if I don't get to it then? Well, then you're going to prune whenever you can, so don't worry about it. But at bud break, you can really see what needs to come out. What does come out? Anything dead. Any dead canes are pruned to healthy tissue. You may want to form the rose bush or cut it back a bit. So for the repeat blooming roses, I recommend about a third, a third off the top, or if it's a very bushy rose, a third of the canes should come out. If it's a once blooming rose, I would wait till after it flowers. You don't want to prune off all the beautiful flower buds. And in fact, many of these once blooming roses don't really care to have uh, too much pruning done to them. And so I don't think that's a big problem there. Now, uh, some people used to prune in the fall. I don't recommend any pruning in the fall unless it's dead tissue or you have a very long cane that you're afraid may be damaged in the winter winds. 
you can prune that back. You really want your roses to go into winter with as much of the green growth to produce, um, you know, it's, for, it's nutrients for next spring so that you get that great flush of growth. Deadheading, what does that mean? It means you take off the spent flowers. Some rose bushes conveniently now are self-cleaning. Oh, great, they do, it does it for you. The once blooming roses, you don't even have to deadhead. Many uh, will produce beautiful rose hips. But for those roses you want to encourage more uh, blooms on, you need to deadhead. So what are you going to do? Try to go back to the first five leaf Leaf, five leaflet leaf and prune above that. If you can't find a five leaflet leaf, go to the first three leaflet leaf and prune it off or just do your best. When you deadhead, you will encourage a lot more flower production. Okay, roses which have stood the test of time. Excuse me, Donna, before you get started in this oh. section, I have one question. Uh, Elizabeth was asking, when do you start the black spot treatment? Okay, that's a good question. Um, the best time, because black spot, interestingly enough, likes cool, moist weather. When does that happen? In the spring. And what's happening then? Your roses are starting to leaf out. That's when you're going to start your fungicide spray. As per the label directions, you're going to start at bud break. And most likely, you're going to repeat. It could be seven days. It could be 12 days. It could be 14 days. So, again, at bud break, that is when you start. And, again, you may have to reapply after heavy rains. But be careful. Try not to use more than needed nor less than needed to be effective. Well, this picture, this is my rose garden. And I did mention earlier that... Your roses are going to be the most spectacular end of May, June. They're all going to come out. They're all going to be filled with lush flowers. The fragrance is going to be the most intense. The color is going to be the most saturated. For the repeat blooming roses, they will repeat, but it's never going to quite look, I think, as good as this. But you will get more roses. You may, in the fall, see another little round of your rose bushes uh, filled with flowers and good fragrance. But the most spectacular time is that first flush. Okay, the first roses I'm going to discuss with you are called damask roses. You could see on the screen, there's the bushes are kind of grown together. They're pretty big shrubs, these damask roses. The one on the right, the light pink, is called Celsiana. And Celsiana grows about six feet tall. It has about two-inch, semi-double, light pink flowers. Damask roses are noted for their intense fragrance. It, it literally perfumes the air. In fact, these roses, the damask roses, are still grown today in many parts of the world for their fragrance, for the oils, for the fragrance industry. It is intoxicating. The damask roses I have um, produce very few uh, thorns. I have never seen black spot on them. Again, the fragrance is beautiful, makes great potpourri. And um, however, they do tend to only bloom once. But that bloom is spectacular, as you could see. And it might go on for about three, hour, three, three hours, right? <laughs> it might go on for about three weeks, not three hours, three weeks. So this one is Celsiana. The one to the left of it, which is a medium pink, is called Ispahan. Funny name, I know. It goes back to about the 1800s. These damask roses are what they call ancient roses, way before 1867, and um, they are in antiquity. Uh, they're not even certain where they may have originated, but they are beautiful. Ispahan has three-inch double medium pink flowers. Again, that heavenly damask fragrance. It grows a little taller, I think you can notice. It can grow to about seven feet tall, has very small um, thorns, which makes it great when you produce, <laughs> when you have to prune it. And again, it is a once-blooming rose. 
a number of these do produce great rose tips later in the season. Again, I've never seen any black spot on these roses. So do consider them, even though they are once blooming. Here's another old time rose called Rosa Gallica officinalis. In antiquity, uh, it was used actually for medicinal purposes. That's why it has officinalis in its name. But look at these beautiful four inch semi double rosy pink petals. And then you notice the gorgeous yellow stamens that are in the middle. I just think that's spectacular. Again, very strong, sweet fragrance makes great potpourri, um, but once blooming. No disease on this plant at all, and few thorns. If you plant Rosa Gallica officinalis on its own root, I can tell you, though, it will sucker. What does that mean? You're going to get a colony of these roses. Maybe that's not such a bad thing after all. China doll. Here's a lovely little doll of a rose. It's a polyantha, precursor to the floribundas. Just means lower grows it, growing cluster rose. You could see the immense amount of bloom on the china doll. It only grows about two feet tall, and the flowers are one to two inches. They're pink and white, and they're in such great clusters, it, it almost looks like, you know, it's smothering the plant. They have beautiful ruffles at the edges. This rose has a light musky scent and it has few thorns, very healthy foliage. It will repeat bloom throughout the growing season. Betty Pryor is a floribunda and she grows about five feet tall. And if you look at her, I think it looks like pink dogwoods almost. It's a lovely rose. It has light, Scent, or some may say scentless, but it's a very tough rose and it will rebloom for you throughout the season. So if you want something that looks like a pink dogwoods but is a rose, maybe Betty's your rose. Marmalade skies. Wow, this, look at this intense color. Tangerine orange. It's electric. And in fact, this rose is a bloom machine. Covers the plant in these magnificent orange roses. It's a powerful color. This rose only grows about three by three, three feet by three foot wide. It has a light scent. It has good repeat. And it also is a pretty disease resistant rose. Now it also makes a great cut flower. Honey perfume is a honey of a rose. What a beautiful apricot yellow flower. I love this rose, it's one of my favorites. It has a strong spicy scent. It will produce flowers singly or in clusters. It's a floribunda. It's a lovely cut flower. It has very good disease resistance and it is a strong rebloomer. It has nice glossy green foliage. If you want something cool in the garden, I think you should consider iceberg. It produces semi-double, three-inch wide, pure white flowers, and it has a sweet, sweet fragrance. Not too many thorns on this rose. I think if you look at the leaves, you could see how healthy they look, and they do stay that way for much of the growing season. Iceberg grows about five feet tall and about as wide. Now, be careful. There is a climber. It's a beautiful climber, but make certain that you get the Floribunda rose instead of the climber if that's what you want. You know, I had a friend who once said to me, I have a pink rose in my garden. Can you help me name it? I said, well, I, I don't know what I can tell you. She said, well, the only thing I can tell you about is it grows up to the second story of my house. Well, at least I could tell her she had a climber. Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln's a hybrid tea rose. Long stems. Look at that bud. They're spectacular. It, they are absolutely beautiful. Mr. Lincoln happens to grow to be a tall rose, six or seven feet tall, produces five inch high scented classic hybrid tea flowers. The color is deep red. And as it matures, you may even see some blue in it. 
It has the most intense fragrance, a damask fragrance, just like the damask roses I showed you earlier. It's a great cut flower. One of these in a bud vase is, is just beautiful. I also like to make potpourri from this rose. Now, the hybrid teas are not quite as bushy as the floribundas and those other shrub roses, the damask. They produce three to five canes, and maybe they're not as leafy. But as long as the leaves are healthy, that's okay. Now, Mr. Lincoln is, does repeat well. I will tell you he does get some black spots for me, but he has come back every, every year. Gold medal. It's a pretty, pretty rose. Double golden flowers, often edged in pink or even some orange. This is a very vigorous uh, shrub. It has a beautiful tea fragrance. So you get somewhat large flowers that can produce singly or in clusters. This rose can grow up to six feet tall too, and it does have good disease resistance. This sun sprinkles, it's a miniature. It only grows about two feet tall. The flowers are about two inches wide and they're sunny yellow. It has a nice spicy scent. Miniatures are great for lining a bed uh, with, uh, you know, in your garden or for growing in containers. This rose again has a spicy scent with a little bit of musk. Sea foam. Now sea foam, uh, the, it's the rose on the left and on the right, the white one. Sea foam is an interesting shrub rose, very leafy, very much full of canes, lots of leaf growth, lots of flowers. They're double and they're creamy white. What's interesting with sea foam is it grows about three feet tall, but six feet wide. It would make a good rose on an embankment or even as a ground cover. It has a light scent but it does have lots of thorns. It has good repeat, good disease resistance. Pink knockout. Oh, the knockout roses are so popular these days. In fact, it's now, they're now celebrating their 20th anniversary. The first rose was just knockout, a, a red single. This is pink knockout. This was, I think, one of the, the second one introduced. It, it also is a bloom machine. The knockout roses are filled with leaves, filled with beautiful stems, lots and lots of about three inch of flowers. This one happens to be a semi-double pink, literally covers the bush all summer. What is great about this rose too, it is extremely tough. It takes drought, it will take heat, it will take cold. It doesn't get pretty much any disease and the flowers are self-cleaning. Is there any drawback to the knockouts? Well, they're very thorny. The flowers aren't great cut flowers, and there's very little scent. But I can tell you, they really will bloom their heads off all summer. This is a tough, tough shrub. You can see here, this is a, another picture of the pink knockout. It's uh, showing you uh, the pretty pink flowers that exist. And these days they have bred uh, double. So you have double knockout, double pink knockout. There's white, there's yellow, there's even a coral one, pretty much to meet everyone's taste. Tough, one of the toughest shrubs you can plant in your garden. Abraham Darby is one of the English roses. I happen to love this rose a lot. It is a spectacular apricot color, and it often has some pink tones in it. It has a heavenly fruity scent. He grows about six to seven feet tall and is very lush. Later, I can show you a picture of the bush in full, full bloom. Good disease resistance does get some black spot every year. Seems to laugh it off. And it has a good repeat uh, bloom cycle. Lovely, lovely cut flower. I always have some of these in a vase on my kitchen counter. Abraham Darby. Look at that flower. Looks like an old world rose, but is a modern rose. Repeats its bloom. This is called a cupped flower. And again, heavenly fruity scent to it. Another English rose, Gertrude Jekyll, Miss Jekyll. It grows about five feet tall. 
has this lovely uh, porcelain pink flower, a very sweet rose scent, great cut flower. Don't those flowers almost look like they're sculptured? They do to me. It's another ro great rose in my rose garden. Beautiful cut flower, nice for making potpourri. Again, we'll get some black spot every year. Comes back for me. Graham Thomas, butter yellow blooms, beautiful. He can grow up to eight feet tall. He has a tea fragrance, which is very, very clean, very nice. If there's a drawback to Mr. Thomas, it's just that it took about three growing seasons to get established in my garden. And this one isn't a good cut flower. You can cut them, but within two days or so, they shatter. They just fall apart. So it's not a great cut rose. Good repeat bloom, though, and it does brighten up the garden. The herbalist. This is a modern English shrub rose from Mr. Austin. If you look at it, you may say, didn't I see a rose like that earlier? And you did. It was called Rosa Gallica officinalis. Well, Mr. Austin bred this rose from old world and new ones. He made it, well, it came out. It, it looks like the old world rose. It has the semi-double rosy pink petals with those spectacular golden stamens. Difference is, this one will bloom off and on all summer. The Rosa Gallica does not. However, this rose doesn't have much of a scent where the Rosa Gallica does. Ah, Dainty Bess. Dainty Bess grows about three to four feet tall. It is a hybrid tea. Doesn't look like a typical one, but because it has a lot of hybrid tea in it, it's classified as a hybrid tea. It's actually a single rose. But look at that shell pink, pastel pink color and those beautiful maroon stamens. It just looks so different in the garden. It has good disease resistance and it has good repeat bloom and a mild, spicy scent to it. Sharifa Asma, that's a unique name. It's an English shrub rose from Mr. Austin, mother of pearl pink. This picture may look more white, but it's mother of pearl pink. Beautiful shade of pink. Grows about four feet tall. Has a sweet scent of damask and myrrh in it but it does have lots of thorns, so be careful when you're pruning uh, Sharifa there. Very good disease resistance. New Dawn is the climber in the background. It is a heavy spring bloomer. The blooms of New Dawn, it's still one of the most popular roses because of its three inch shell pink or silvery pink uh, flowers that have a sweet, sweet scent to them. This covers my pergola. This is in my rose garden. Now, it will rebloom for you, but it's never going to rebloom as lush as this. Very good disease resistant, beautiful fragrance, nice cut flower. I will tell you the truth, though. Climbers are a bit more work. After about five years, you're going to start getting in to prune out older canes, and you have to get up on a ladder to start pruning back some of the canes that have grown across what you see as my pergola. This rose can produce canes up to 20 feet long, so you do have to attach them to a support structure. But it's great to sit under that pergola in the summer on a bench and just smell that heavenly sweet rose. Electron. This rose is unbelievable. It's neon pink. I like to say I think this rose comes with batteries. The color just shines in the garden. Electron grows about four to five feet tall. It's a hybrid tea. It has a very good bloom cycle, strong rose scent. It's a great cut flower, great rose for the nose as well. It does have many thorns, though, so you have to be careful. You can decide if you want your rose garden to just be roses. Some people grow roses, just want roses. Personally, I prefer to plant some other plants. This is my rose garden again. And what I like to underplant my roses with are some herbs like garden sage, lavender, 
uh, carnations, even red Reuben basil. I love to have basil in my rose garden. Then I also plant some annuals, like the alyssum in the front, the small growing white flower, a sweet alyssum. To the back of that, you could see dianthus or carnations or sweet williams. Some people like to plant sweet williams. I also do plant some perennials, like phlox, in my rose garden. And again, it underplants the roses. You could see all at one time this lush, spectacular scene. And then when the roses are coming and going throughout the summer, I still have my herbs or my annuals or perennials blooming. Here's just another picture of some carnations at the base of the English uh, shrub roses I talked about earlier. To the right, you could see that's Graham Thomas. Does grow pretty tall. Next to it to the left, the peachy rose, that's Abraham Darby. So you really get to see now these English roses in, in all their glory. Uh, you could see that uh, at the now we have some recommended rose catalog companies that you could just call them or go to their website. I know today, these days, you mostly go to the website, and uh, you could look at the different roses they have or plants and consider purchasing them. This is only one source. Again, local nurseries and box stores uh, can also maybe, you know, be of use and help to you. So... Um, I don't know. I think I've covered everything that I had hoped to cover uh, with you this evening as far as some of the conditions to provide your roses with and which roses I have uh, suggested to you. Now, I want you to know there are many, many roses that are very tough, durable, and disease resistant. These are just a sampling that I brought to you tonight. So, um, you know, I, I would consider many other roses as well. If there's any other questions or something I can help somebody with, I'd be happy to, to do that. Yeah, Donna, we have a couple questions. Um, Thomas was asking, how did Knockout Roses come about? Mr. Radler produced them. He actually was an amateur rose gardener producing them in his basement. And what he did is he was crossing different species of roses. I can tell you right now, I can't remember which ones, but he was using different species of roses. That's how a lot of roses are, are um, actually created today, either cross-pollinated, um, and now they're introducing, uh, as I said, species that haven't been used before. So he was producing them in his base basement for some time and then began growing them out and went to a certain uh, rose, rose company, and they liked what they saw. And in the year 2000, they introduced the first knockout rose, which was a single cherry uh, red rose. So, unfortunately, I can't tell you. You could go online and probably read about the knockout roses, but that's how Mr. Radler produced his series, and now he's introduced uh, so many others. Great. And speaking of knockout roses, uh, Doris is asking, when is the best time to transplant a knockout rose to a different spot? Okay. Um, it's getting a little late now. You need about six to eight weeks for a rose to become established before frost. But if you have to move it, move it now. I mean, you may have no other choice. Move it now. But if you can wait... I think it would be better now to wait until um, early April to, or end of March if we're having a mild winter or by early April to move the rose. And Catherine was asking, when is the best time to plant a new rose? The same thing. In our area, most rose companies won't send you a rose plant now because it, they're too afraid that, you know, you won't, it won't have enough time to get settled in. In fact, catalog companies, the same thing. The best time to plant any new rose, again, is April. If you wait too long, you say, well, what about June? If it's starting to get hot, can you plant a rose in June? Yes. You just will have to keep mulch it, and you'll have to probably water it more often. But the best time would be in April. Now, if you're going to order roses, let me give you a little tip. The best time to order is probably in February. Why? Because they're going to have the best selection and they're going to be available. Trust me, I've done this. I started to call companies in early April 
You're going to be disappointed if you have your heart set on certain roses. They may be sold out. Okay, great suggestion. Thank you. Um, and then Sheba was asking if um, you had any suggestions uh, about deer problems in the garden. Okay, a fence. Okay. Um, just like with any plant that deer loves, like hostas and roses, you really would need to fence the property in, and it would have to be a high fence uh, to keep the deer out. There are some, ro uh, I'm sorry, deer repellents you could try. The best thing is to put a deer repellent on as your roses are coming out of winter hibernation, starting to grow. You want to put the repellents on because if a deer comes along and nibbles, maybe he doesn't like that taste, he's going to keep going and saying, this isn't the place I want to be eating. And you will have to reapply the repellent, particularly after rains, and you may have to change off different repellents. But that's the best that you could do with the deer. Okay. Um, Dawn is asking, uh, when you don't know which type of uh, which type your rose is, how do you know how much to trim? Okay, well, you can wait um, a year to see, you know, it, well, first of all, I'm sorry. If the rose is blooming in April, or starting to come out, rather, blooming in May and into June, um, you need to prune it. If you need to prune it, let's say it's getting too big, you could prune it by back by a third. You might... Uh, you might not want to prune any rose that you're not certain about in April. Why? If you've inherited a once blooming rose and you prune it heavily or you prune it way back, you may prune off all the flowers. Okay, what's the worst thing that happened then? You didn't get many flowers. Next year, you know, don't prune that rose till after it blooms. I would think most roses you're going to find in your gardens are probably repeat bloomers. I've inherited a rose in my garden that has to be 60-plus years old because the trunk is huge on it, and it is a repeat bloomer. So um, trial and error, experiment. If you need to prune, prune it. But I don't recommend that you heavily prune any rose. Like some people will say prune it way back almost, you know, down to 10 inches or something. I don't know why you'd want to do that. That rose is now going to spend all its time trying to grow to the height it wants to be, and you're going to have delayed flowering. So when in doubt, do some light pruning. So Donna, you had mentioned this before about uh, sun requirements. Um, what do you feel about semi-shade uh, for, for roses? Well, the knockouts can take less sunlight. Um, what I said earlier still holds. Uh, the roses prefer around six hours. They will still bloom with less sunlight. However, you're just going to get less flower production. Again, though, knockout roses uh, are known to be so tough and apparently can take some of that less sunlight down to almost four hours, I've read, though I don't have experience with that myself. Here's what you need to do. Trial and error. When you go to the websites or if you get catalogs, many times uh, these companies will indicate if a rose can take, let's say, less sunlight or a bit more shade. Those are the roses you're going to look to plant where you have some, uh, some more shade, let's say. Now, I don't know where the shade is coming from. Perhaps if it's a, a tree, you might be able to have some some of it thinned. I didn't say take it out, but thin to let in more sunlight. Okay. Um, and then as far as soil requirements, um, someone was asking, um, is sand or clay better for roses? Probably more <laughs> of, a, of a loam, <laughs> somewhere in between. Well, the sandy soil, if it's too sandy, think about it. Water just runs through. The fertilizer is going to run through. And if it's, like, down the seashore, that's tough. You might want to go with rugoses there. But think about it. The roses need to be anchored. So I'm going to suggest you add lots of compost or uh, organic matter to that uh, area where you're planting if the soil's sandy. Or consider container gardening. 
Same thing with clay. If it's too thick that you can almost form a statue out of, uh, I'm going to recommend that you loosen it, add lots of organic matter. It could be compost, peat moss, shredded leaves, dehydrated cow manure. And you're going to dig down well, as far as you can go, loosen it, and add some of that uh, organic matter. You may want to consider in tougher soils raised beds, like I showed you, my, uh, my rose garden was raised up 15 inches, and that will help with poorer soil and uh, drainage issues, or you might consider growing your roses in containers. Great. And then, so what's uh, an average lifespan for roses? Okay, a, a budded rose, that grafted rose, about 15 years. Own root roses can go on almost forever. Own root roses, um, you probably found old homesteads or in, in cemeteries where people planted roses 50 or more years ago. I told you I have a rose bush on my property that's about 60-plus uh, years old, and the, the bottom trunk is so huge. So an own root rose, as long as the roots uh, survive every year, can go on and on. But a grafted rose, many of them start to poop out about the 15th year. You might get 20 years out of them. Are you uh, familiar with the Rosa rugosa and its origins, Donna? Japan, Korea. These roses um, don't like to be sprayed. They're usually very disease resistant, and they can take salt in the air. They are known to grow near bodies of water that have more salt in the air. So uh, the rugosas are pretty tough. Many have lovely fragrances, and they do repeat bloom and produce beautiful hips. Uh, our, so Catherine has been using Bayer 3-in-1. It's a fertilizer, disease control, and insecticide. Uh, is that a product you would recommend? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to say a product is bad, but here's what I'm going to state about using multiple uh, products with multiple, uh, you know, things in them. If you have a disease on your rose bush, you treat for the disease. Why would you treat for an insect problem if you have no insects? Same thing. If you have an insect problem like Japanese beetles or aphids on your roses, why are you treating for a disease problem that doesn't exist? It's a waste of product. It may not be good for the environment or for some pollinators that are in your yard. Uh, fertile, I like to keep everything personally separate. If I'm going to fertilize my roses, I fertilize them. If I need, which rarely I've done, but I have, sprayed for a disease problem, I use a fungicide labeled for a rose and for the problem I have, which is usually black spot. If it's an insect problem, I'm going to use an insecticide. And that is what I think is best for the environment, your pocketbook, and the rose plant. Uh, what do you recommend as far as mulching for winter? I put a mulch on my roses all year round. I should have mentioned that. Uh, after I plant the rose or every year when I'm refreshing the mulch, I like to put down a minimum of an inch up to two inches. And I personally use uh, shredded oak leaves that my husband and I go out every fall and we spend three weeks collecting and chopping and I store them over the winter and I love to spread that on my roses, um, you know, during the next growing season. But I always have mulch on my roses. Keeps the soil cool in the summer. It will help keep weeds down. It will also, um, you know, help with your watering issues. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't need as much water. It may help a little bit in preventing black spot as well. If your roses, you want to plant roses that are hardy for our area here. So you shouldn't have to worry about uh, wrapping your rose with burlap or tipping it over or heavily mulching it. Um, if you have a tender rose that you love and some company was willing to sell it to you, you may then have to wrap it, put stakes around it, three stakes, wrap it in burlap, and then put in uh, around the base of the rose uh, a lot of chopped leaves or some kind of organic matter to protect that rose during the wintertime. But I really recommend uh, purchasing hardy roses for our area, which would 
Well, depend what part of Jersey you're in. Could be zone six, could be zone seven. And I always go on, I always go on the side of caution. I don't go up in zone. I always go down as a, just to make certain the rose survives. So if someone has a question about um, voles and moles around their roses, and uh, to me that sounds like a grub problem. What do you think, Donna? I'm sorry. They said they think they have moles or moles and voles around their. Oh, oh dear. Well, they probably are uh, are disturbing the roots of the rose, and um, they might be going after, like Angela mentioned, uh, feeding on an insect. So you may want to check. Uh, the soil, uh, maybe you can cut up a square foot section and roll it back if that's possible. Or dig down, do you see white, fat, grubby looking things? You may need to treat for that because maybe the, the moles or the voles are going after that. Or the, mo the voles may also be eating bulbs you may have planted nearby. And uh, not so much, I think, that they're eating the rose roots, but they're probably interfering with... Um, uh, you know, just running through the roses and probably making making a bit of a mess around the rose bush. So, how do you chop your leaves, Donna? We have um, a leaf eater thing. Well, I don't know if I can mention the company. It's it's a vacuum system, a piece of equipment my husband purchased. He we go out. And we go to a place we know that has all these oak leaves that fall down, which I love. He sucks them up into a bag. It chops them. I'm standing by with a big plastic bag. The chopped leaves go into it. We fill these 42-gallon bags each, and I collect easily 35, 40 of them per uh, November. We store them on the side. We cover them. And then next spring, when I'm either planting a new rose or if I, I need to replenish my mulch, out come the rows, uh, the bags with the chopped oak leaves, and I spread them out. It has a wonderful fragrance. And I can tell you, after doing this for 20-something years, I have the most magnificent earthworms in my soil, and I have nice, friable soil. Sounds lovely. Um, Lisa is having problems with her knockouts, or with their knockouts um, growing. So... Uh, they were growing very well, and it was very tall, but after trimming, it stopped growing and flowering. Um, and so it's been about two years, and it hasn't grown or bloomed. bloomed. It hasn't grown or bloomed at all. Wow. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've fertilized. Even though they're a tough rose, roses do like fertilizing. So, again, you're not going to do anything now. Now the roses are going in for winter rest. Next April, as I mentioned at bud break, start fertilizing. Purchase one of the rose fertilizers. This way you'll have a mix of all the nutrients in there that you'll need. If you have hot, if we have hot dry spells, do give it that two to three gallons of water, even though these are tough roses. Um, the only other thing I can think of, and if it's in full sunlight, um, and it does come out every spring, and it's producing green growth, but no flowers at all. That's that's unusual. Don't prune it at all. Let it be and see what happens next year. Um, most of the knockouts I didn't think were grafted, but even if it was grafted and the top uh, the graft area died, the top good rose would die off. You would get a wild rose. You would get some kind of rose. It would probably be a single red, very rangy rose growing. only blooms briefly uh, in the early summer, and then it's out of bloom, and it usually gets a lot of black spot. That's usually a typical rootstock used in this area. Final thing I could say, if you have fertilized it, you're not pruning it, you're giving it water, it doesn't seem to have any insect or disease problems, the only thing I could say is consider removing it and giving another rose a chance. It's unusual for a knockout to do this, though, but, hey, things happen. It's nature. Okay. Um, Katie was asking whether you keep the shredded oak leaves in black bags, and uh, if so, do you keep the bags open or closed? I close the bags, put them on their side, and we actually cover them with a tarp, 
because I want to keep a lot of the moisture out because if you keep them upright, you will get a lot more moisture into them. And then when you go to open them in the spring, because I've done this, you'll have a lot of wet leaves and it's very heavy to move and it can feel kind of icky. That's a tech technical term, icky. Um, so we put them on the side, we seal them, and we cover them with a tarp. And then come next April, we lug them out over to the rose garden. And actually, I use them in my vegetable garden as well. They make a great mulch in the vegetable garden or even in your perennial beds um, or annual beds, whatever you may have. And the leaves, because we did chop them, they're nice and friable. They spread beautifully. I think they look nice, they smell nice, and they certainly make the soil better. Okay. Um, these are most of the questions I have for right now. Um, like I said, next week, um, we're going to have our garlic growing webinar. This is the time of year to start planting your garlic. Um, and the garlic gap will give you some really great tips on how to grow garlic and what to do. Um, and so, um, oh, Catherine is also asking, uh, um, is it true oak leaves are, are not good for composting? But I think you kind of answered that question already, Donna. Um, if I could, well, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer any more of them. But I do want to um, say something else about a rose garden. I do hope that however many roses you have, it could be one, could be 20, could be more. I hope that you do enjoy them, that you take the time to look at their beauty and to smell them. Hopefully they do have some fragrance. Uh, cut a few and bring them in the house. Uh, it's just a, wonderful to have roses cut in the house, use them for potpourri, and to enjoy their beautiful form and fragrance. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and so this uh, presentation is uh, has been recorded. So uh, if you missed any past recordings, you can visit uh, tinyurl.com slash rcevids to view past topics. And if you have any questions, any more gardening questions, um, you can visit the helpline. You can call our helpline. Um, here in Middlesex County, the phone number is 732-398-5220, or you can email us at mastergardeners at co.middlesex.nj.us and ask your gardening questions. Um, we're, still, we'll, we're still answering questions if you got them. Um, and then to view upcoming presentations um, or the dates for different topics coming up, you can visit tinyurl.com slash midcode dates, and that will give you the list of all the presentations coming up. So, um, Hello, Angela. Hi, Bill. Hey, I just wanted to thank you and especially thank Donna Pemberton. Donna, that was great. Um, Donna is our queen of roses, and she knows everything there is to know about roses and gave a fantastic presentation. And, and Donna, I thank you so much for sharing all your wonderful knowledge with everybody. Um, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And and the, the wonderful thing about our the Master Gardener programs when we resume is that we have people like Angela and Donna that provide training for all of you. So um, uh, please, uh, you know, look into joining your local Master Gardener program. Every county in New Jersey, um, I think almost everyone has a Master Gardener program. Uh, and we have a very active program in Middlesex County, of which uh, Donna is part of that. She was our coordinator for a while, and now Angela is our coordinator. Um, and we've got a great team, and I want to also thank uh, Dave Smola for all of his hard work and putting this together with Angela and our entire team. Uh, but Donna, we uh, treasure your uh, sharing all of your advice with everybody and your wisdom over the years okay. because, uh, you know, you, you got me interested a little bit in roses. I grow a little bit nowhere near what uh, you have at your place. You, you have the most amazing collection. But I just want to thank everybody for joining us Uh and uh, hopefully everyone can join us next week as well. So thank you so much. Good, good hearing from you, Bill.
Oh, quick one uh, from Katie, Donna. Um, how do you feel about pine needles around roses for a mulch? If that's what you have, I use them. I don't object to any good quality mulch. It's nice organic matter. If you have a large supply, you, you may want to consider, though, maybe mixing it in with some chopped leaves or dehydrated cow manure. Uh, the only thing is when the uh, pine needles dry, you know, they're going to be uh, the kind of tan in color. Uh, not that that's anything wrong with that, but they, they may not look as, as, as pretty. And, again, to help those pine needles break down because they're pretty tough, I suggested maybe, again, some shredded leaves with it, maybe a little pine, pine bark with it, or dehydrated cow manure would um, – I think be a little better. Okay, good. Um, and Deanna was asking about uh, if you could repeat the pruning rule about the five and three leaf. Oh, it's deadheading. But that's, deadheading. you want to deadhead the spent flowers so you get more flowers. So if you look under where the rose was, you're going to see a smaller stem part. Follow that. If you can, to the first five leaflets, it's a leaf, but there'll be five parts to that leaf on the rose. Prune it there. It tends to create better regrowth. If you can't find one or it's too far down, I wouldn't fret over it. Go to the first three leaflet leaf of the rose bush. On some roses, like Floribundus, to tell you the truth, it, they're so full of, of leaves, Sometimes it, you just go underneath the, the flower cluster and cut two or three of them off. That will be okay as well. So I hope you, you understand that. And trial and error. So don't worry. You're not going to harm your rose bush if you didn't get to that five leaflet leaf thing. Donna, if you were to pick your top two or three roses, uh, what would they be for easy care? And best blooming. And for, me, water. for me, Abraham Darby. Um, that's the David Austin rose. That's that apricot rose that had some peachy apricot color with some pink. It grew rather tall. I think there were several pictures of it. it has the old world looking flower to it, heavenly, uh, a very fruity fragrance. I said it gets some black spots. I have had Abraham Darby over 15 years in my garden. I've never sprayed him. I absolutely love that rose. I think right now my other favorite are my damask roses. They are just so beautiful in bloom. Those are the ancient type roses. They only bloom once, late May, early June, but they have just an unbelievably beautiful fragrance, and I do cut some for the house. So my damask roses, whether it's Celsiana, Ispahan, but there are other varieties of damask roses. And then Abraham Darby would be my personal favorites. So for so for cutting flowers, the uh, uh, damask roses would be the best for cut flowers? Um, I would say the best would be... Something like your Eng well Abraham Darby, not all like I mentioned. Graham Thomas isn't a good cut flower. Hybrid teas make some of the best cut flowers, and the Floribundas. Mister Lincoln is a spectacular cut flower. You can cut a long cane. It has that beautiful uh, urn shaped bud, and then it opens to this very wide, high centered flower with intense fragrance. So. Some of your best cut, flat, cut roses would be a hybrid tea or the Floribundas overall. I was happy to give this presentation now, and I'll tell you why. Now is the time, those of you who are going to plant a rose garden or replant some roses, now is the time to start going on websites or getting the old-fashioned way catalogs and thinking about what rose, what kind of rose, the color rose, the size rose plant you want, because over the winter time is the best time to make a decision on what you wish to order. And again, the best time to order is February. You're going to ask for them to be delivered to your area, most likely in April. And hopefully, if the winter's not too bad, you can get out there and prepare or know where you're going to plant the rose. So you should have a site already lined up. And 
next uh, late winter, early spring, get the site ready. And then when you get your roses in, follow directions. They may tell you to soak the rose for 24 hours, maybe not. Follow what the company says. But now is the time to start thinking about what roses you want for your garden next year. Anna, thank you again so much for joining us. And um, you know, thank you to all our freeholders who support us in the Are You Ready to Garden webinar series. Uh, they've been really great in helping to promote us and to support us. Thanks to Dave and everyone. Hopefully, see you all next week. Thank you. Good night. Good night.